Earth, Atmosphere and Space. The Earth, the world we live on, is a great ball of rock. It measures over 12,750 kilometers across at its widest point, the equator. But rocky material, or land, covers less than a third of the Earth's surface. More than two-thirds of the surface is covered by the water of the oceans. Water is one of the two vital substances that makes possible life on Earth. The other vital substance is the layer of air that surrounds the Earth. This layer, the atmosphere, is made up of a mixture of gases. All living things, plants and animals alike, need to breathe one of these gases, oxygen, in order to stay alive. Oxygen makes up about 21% of the air by volume. The rest is mostly nitrogen gas. Another vital gas in the air is carbon dioxide. Plants need to take in this gas to make their food. They combine it with water they take in through their roots to make sugar but they can carry out this process only in the light. They need the energy in sunlight to get it going. That is why the food making process is called photosynthesis, which means making with light. All life on Earth in fact hinges on photosynthesis. Animals can't make food themselves and must eat plants for food, or eat other animals that feed on plants. The energy we receive from the sun is not just important for making food for living things. It also keeps our world at a suitable temperature in which living things in enormous variety can thrive and multiply. Without the heat from the sun, the earth would be a deep frozen dead world. The atmosphere also plays a vital role in keeping our world at a reasonable temperature. It acts as an insulating blanket at night to stop the sun-warmed earth cooling down too much. Compared with the size of the earth itself, the layer of atmosphere is extremely thin. It is thinner, for example, than the peel of an orange is relative to the size of the orange. The atmosphere extends upwards over our heads but it is not the same all the way up. Because of its weight, it is densest or thickest at the bottom, at sea level. It gets gradually less dense or thinner the higher up we go. At sea level, the weight of the air pressing down exerts on each square centimetre of surface a pressure of about one kilogram. This is termed the atmospheric pressure. Meteorologists the scientists who study the weather, measure the pressure in units called millibars. Sea level pressure averages about 1,000 millibars. The atmospheric pressure falls, the air thins, progressively as you climb higher and higher above sea level. At the height of Everest, nearly 9 kilometres, the air is so thin you can hardly breathe. Here you are approaching the top of the layer of atmosphere known as the troposphere. At twice this height, where the supersonic airliner Concorde flies, you are in the next layer of atmosphere, the stratosphere. And the pressure is so low that if you were exposed to it, your blood would boil. Within the stratosphere is a layer of ozone, a different form of oxygen which has three instead of the usual two atoms in its molecules. The ozone layer also plays a vital role in helping life on Earth. It does so by filtering out from sunlight most of the harmful ultraviolet rays. These are the rays that cause sunburn. Without the ozone layer, the intensity of ultraviolet radiation would have a devastating effect on both plant and animal life. 
That is why the observed thinning of the ozone layer because of atmospheric pollution is so worrying. The air gets thinner and thinner as you climb higher and higher through the atmosphere. The stratosphere ends at a height of about 50 kilometers. Thereafter, the air that is still present exists not as molecules, but as charged particles or ions. This part of the atmosphere is therefore called the ionosphere. In this region, there are layers that reflect radio waves, a property used for long distance round the world broadcasting. It is also in the ionosphere that displays of the northern and southern lights take place. These colourful light displays occur in polar regions when streams of charged particles from the sun run into the ions in the atmosphere. The streaks we call meteors also originate in the ionosphere, as rocky specks are attracted by gravity into the upper air and burn up. The air thins rapidly going up into the ionosphere, and by a height of about 250 kilometres there is scarcely any air left at all. To all intents and purposes, we are in space. At this height, satellites can orbit the Earth without experiencing any appreciable air resistance. They can, therefore, maintain their speed and their ability to stay aloft. The Space Shuttle sometimes orbits as low as this on its relatively short journey space. But a satellite orbiting for a long time at this height will be gradually slowed down by the faint traces of air remaining. When its speed falls below orbital velocity, 28,000 kilometers an hour, it will drop back to Earth. When the Space Shuttle Orbiter wishes to return to Earth from space, the Shuttle Pilot fires rockets to slow it down. It drops from orbit down towards the ground. As it drops lower, the air outside begins to thicken, but at first there is little effect on the orbiter. Not until it has dropped to a height of about 120 kilometers does the air begin to offer noticeable resistance, or drag. This marks the re-entry interface for the orbiter which is now travelling at a speed of about 26,000 kilometres an hour. As the orbiter drops lower and lower, the drag on it increases dramatically, rapidly slowing it down. Friction between the orbiter and the air generates tremendous heat. This causes the tiled underside of the craft to glow red hot. In less than 20 minutes, the orbiter's speed has been halved, and it is beginning to fly like a plane rather than a spacecraft. The air continues to break the orbiter and in another 10 minutes or so it will land on the runway at a speed of only about 350 kilometers an hour. In the autumn, the apples on an apple tree ripen and, if they're not picked, they one by one detach themselves from the branches and drop to the ground. A force must be pulling them downwards. When you throw a ball into the air, it travels up and over in an arc, but soon falls back down to the ground. Again, a force must be pulling it downwards. This downwards force is gravity. It is the attraction or pull the Earth exerts on everything on or near it. All the other heavenly bodies exert gravity in a similar way. Gravity is literally what holds the universe together.
One of the first people to investigate the Earth's gravity was the Italian scientist Galileo in the early 1600s. Galileo lived in Pisa at the time and is supposed to have carried out an experiment from the top of the famous Leaning Tower there. He dropped two weights from the tower, a light one and a heavy one. Scientists of the time believed that heavy objects fell faster than light ones, but when Galileo dropped his weights from the tower, they both hit the ground together. Galileo proved in this experiment that, whatever their weight, bodies fall to the earth at the same rate when they are dropped. Prove this for yourself by dropping a golf ball, heavy, and a ping pong ball, light, from the same height. If you dropped a pebble over a high cliff and were able to measure its speed as it fell, you would find that it would be travelling at a speed of about 9.8 metres per second after one second. After another second, it would be travelling 9.8 metres per second faster. And after another second, 9.8 metres per second faster still, and so on. You would find that its speed increased by 9.8 metres per second every second it was falling. In other words, the rate of increase in the pebble's speed, its acceleration, was 9.8 metres per second per second. and every falling body accelerates at this rate because of the Earth's pull. We call this the acceleration due to gravity, or g. We saw in the golf and ping pong ball experiment earlier that both balls hit the ground together. They fall at the same rate because gravity accelerates them equally even though they have a different weight. We would expect any objects to hit the ground together when they are dropped together. But do they? Drop an orange and a balloon together. Do they hit the ground together? You find that they don't. The orange hits the ground before the balloon. So our theory that all objects fall to the ground at the same rate is upset. Clearly, another force is involved here besides gravity. And it is slowing down the balloon. This force is the resistance or drag of the air. Air resists the movement of anything travelling through it. And the bigger the object, the greater is the resistance acting upon it. So the balloon, which is much bigger than the orange, experiences greater air resistance and is slowed down more as it falls. In the same way, a hammer and a feather should fall together when they are dropped, but don't because the air resistance affects the feather more. However, if you drop the hammer and the feather on the moon, they should fall together because there is no air and therefore no air resistance. In fact, one of the Apollo astronauts, David Scott, carried out just this experiment on the Apollo 15 mission in July 1971. He held up the geological hammer he had been working with and a feather he had brought from Earth and let them go. Under the pull of the moon's gravity they both hit the ground together how about that, cried Scott. Mr. Galileo was correct. Galileo died in 1642. By coincidence, this was the same year that another scientific genius was born in England. He was Isaac Newton, whose theoretical and practical work transformed the natural sciences and mathematics. He is particularly remembered for his discovery of the laws of gravity in a story that may or may not be true. The story goes that one day he was sitting under an apple tree when an apple fell to the ground near his feet. This set him wondering whether the force that pulled the apple to the ground, that is gravity, was the same force that keeps the moon circling endlessly round the earth. He decided that it was.
the moon is travelling through space. If no forces acted upon it, it would travel in a straight line. But in fact, it circles round the Earth. So there must be a force connected with the Earth that attracts the moon and makes it travel in a circle, in orbit around the Earth. This force must be the Earth's gravity. You can see how gravity acts on the moon by whirling a stone on a piece of string around your head. Make sure you're out in the open and there is nobody about. The stone keeps travelling in a circle because you are pulling on the string. If you let go of the string, the stone will shoot off in a straight line, and so it is with the moon. Gravity, the inward pull, keeps the moon, the stone, travelling in a circle. If gravity were suddenly to cease, the moon would fly off into space in a straight line. Newton realised that it was not only the Earth that had gravity, but every body in the universe. The gravity of the Sun holds the planets in their orbits in the solar system. Gravity binds stars into great star islands or galaxies, and galaxies into clusters and superclusters. Gravity holds the whole universe together. Newton summed up his ideas on gravity in his universal law of gravitation. Every bit of matter in the universe attracts every other bit of matter with a force that depends on their masses and inversely on the square of the distance between them. Expressing this mathematically, the force of gravity, F, between two bodies of mass, M1 and M2, and distance D apart, is proportional to the product of their two masses, M1 and M2, and 1 over D squared. We can write this as F is proportional to M1, M2, over d squared. This shows that if you double one of the masses, you double the gravitational force. But if you double the distance between them, you reduce the force one quarter, one over two squared. On the Earth, gravitational force, the force of gravity, exists between every object on the Earth's surface and the Earth itself. It acts to pull the object downwards to the surface. It is the force we call weight. From Newton's law of gravitation, we see that this force is proportional to an object's mass. The greater the mass of an object, the more the Earth attracts it, and the greater is its weight. The terms mass and weight are often confused, but as you can see, they are different. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. It never changes. Weight is the force acting on an object because of gravity. It changes when the strength of gravity changes. The force of gravity that attracts an object to the Earth depends, of course, not only on the object's mass, but on the mass of the Earth which is attracting it. So we can say generally that for a given object, the force of gravity it experiences depends on the mass of the attracting body. Or in other words, the weight of an object depends on the mass of the attracting body. For example, the moon is much smaller and has much less mass than the earth, so its gravity is much weaker, only about one-sixth that of the earth. This means that objects on the moon weigh only one-sixth what they do on earth. On the other hand, the planet Jupiter is much bigger and more massive than the Earth, so its gravity is much greater, over two and a half times greater. This means that objects on Jupiter would weigh over two and a half times more than they do on Earth. So we see that a particular object would have a different weight on the Earth, the Moon and Jupiter, but it would still have the same mass. Its mass is fixed. Its weight varies according to the strength of gravity. Coming back to Earth and looking again at Newton's law, we see that the force of gravity on an object also depends on distance, d in the formula. This is the distance between the object and the Earth's centre, its centre of mass. So, as you climb above the surface, gravity gets less, but the change is very gradual. 
Only when you soar hundreds of kilometers into space does gravity weaken markedly, and the higher you go, the weaker it becomes. This explains why satellites orbiting higher up do not have to travel so fast to stay in orbit. In their orbiting spacecraft, we talk of astronauts being in a state of zero G, meaning no gravity. But of course, this is not true. Gravity still acts in orbit. If it didn't, the spacecraft would fly off into space. We also call the zero G condition weightlessness, because nothing in orbit appears to have any weight. Weight is the downwards pull acting on an object because of gravity. And, because gravity is still present in orbit, objects are still being pulled downwards. They are falling towards the Earth. But, you can't measure their weight, the downwards pull on them, with a pair of scales, because the scales will be falling too. Light and radiation. Of all our senses, our sense of sight is perhaps the most important. What we see gives us more information about the world around us than what we hear, smell, touch or taste. We see because our eyes are sensitive to light. During the day, the sun shines and provides the light. When the sun drops below the horizon in the evening, daylight fades and the sky becomes dark. It becomes night. The blackness we see in the night sky is the blackness of space. But the sky is not completely black, for it's studded with thousands of stars. They bathe our world in a very much fainter light. They are suns, like our own sun, and give out equally bright light, but they are so very much farther away that their light is very feeble by the time it reaches us. On some nights the moon shines and lightens the darkness much better than the stars do. But the moon doesn't produce its own light, like the sun. It merely reflects the sunlight that it receives from the sun back to the Earth. Venus, Jupiter, Mars and the other planets we see shining bright in the night sky also reflect sunlight in the same way. And, in its turn, the Earth shines and is visible in space because it reflects sunlight. What exactly is light? It is an electromagnetic wave, a kind of electric and magnetic vibration, or ripple, that travels through space. We can think of it as a kind of wave, similar to the waves that appear on the surface of the water when you throw a stone into a pond. But with light, the waves are vibrating in all planes rather than one. As with all waves, light waves have a certain wavelength. This is the distance between the crests, or high points, of two successive waves, or between the troughs, or low points, of two successive waves. Alternatively, we can describe a wave by its frequency, the number of complete waves passing a certain point every second. A long wavelength means a low frequency, because fewer waves pass per second, and a short wavelength means a higher frequency, because more waves pass every second. Light, however, is not made up of just one wavelength. The white light we receive from the sun is actually a mixture of many wavelengths. Our eyes perceive these different wavelengths as different colours. We see a swash or spread of these colours in the sky when it has been raining as a rainbow. We can also produce the same colour spread or spectrum by passing sunlight through a wedge of glass called a prism. The main colours of the spectrum are violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange and red. In terms of wavelength, violet has the shortest wavelength and red the longest, but all wavelengths are very short indeed. 
They are expressed in units of nanometers, nm, or billionths of a meter. Violet light has a wavelength of about 400 nanometers. Red light, a wavelength of about 700 nanometers. White light is just one way in which the sun gives off or radiates into space the energy it produces in its interior. It also gives off energy as heat rays. They have a longer wavelength than light rays, which we can't see, but we can feel. We call these heat rays infrared rays, meaning that they are beyond the red end of the visible spectrum. Similarly, we detect rays from the sun that have a shorter wavelength than visible light. We call them ultraviolet rays. They are the ones that burn or tan us when we go sunbathing. The sun also radiates its energy at many more wavelengths besides. Ultraviolet, visible and infrared rays form just part of an extended family of rays which differ from one another only in their wavelength. They are all electromagnetic waves like light and they all travel at the same speed as light, a speed of some 300,000 kilometers per second. We call the complete family of waves the electromagnetic spectrum. Going from short to long wavelengths, the spectrum includes gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet rays, visible light, infrared rays, microwaves and radio waves. The range of wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum is enormous. The shortest gamma rays have a wavelength of less than one thousandth of a nanometer, a measurement scientists call one picometer. Put another way, it takes a million million of these waves to measure one meter. On the other hand, the longest radio waves have a wavelength measured in thousands of meters. The atmosphere behaves differently to all the different electromagnetic radiations coming from the sun. We know from what we see and feel that the atmosphere allows through, or is transparent to, radiations from ultraviolet to infrared. We talk about the atmosphere having a light window. We can also detect radio waves from the sun through a radio window in the atmosphere. But there are no windows to let in the other wavelength radiations coming from the sun. The atmosphere absorbs them and prevents them reaching us on the ground. The other suns in our universe, the stars, also give out all kinds of electromagnetic radiation and of this also only visible light and radio waves can reach us through the windows in the atmosphere. The rest is blocked. The only way we can view the stars at the other wavelengths is to send our telescopes and other instruments on satellites above the atmosphere in space. Only by viewing stars and galaxies at all wavelengths can we properly study the universe. Satellite astronomy at invisible wavelengths is now one of the most exciting branches of astronomy and a succession of satellites have made some spectacular finds. They include the X-ray satellite Einstein, the far infrared satellite IRIS, the International Ultraviolet Explorer IUE, and the Cosmic Background Explorer COBE. In 1992, COBE results caused great excitement among astronomers because they confirmed their views of how the universe began and evolved. Astronomers exploit the radio window in the atmosphere by building radio telescopes and some of the most exciting astronomical discoveries in recent years have been made using these instruments. Among these discoveries have been quasars, pulsars and active galaxies which pour out fantastic energy at radio wavelengths. Radio telescopes tune into the radio waves that the stars give out. Mostly they take the form of huge metal dishes which collect the radio signals and focus them onto an antenna. A radio receiver amplifies the signals which a computer can then process into radio images. The biggest radio telescope, built into a mountain top near Arecibo in Puerto Rico, has a dish 305 meters across. The biggest steerable dish, measuring 100 meters across, is at Effelsberg, near Bonn, in Germany. One familiar property of light is that it travels in straight lines. This explains why objects can cast sharp shadows in the sun and why we can't see round corners. When light falls on an object, a variety of things may happen. One, 
the light may bounce off the object, that is, be reflected. Two, the light may pass through the object. And three, the light may be absorbed by the object. In practice, a combination of these things usually happens. When light passes through an object, we say it is translucent. And if it doesn't, we say the object is opaque. If light passes through an object without being distorted, we say it is transparent. Thus, a sheet of frosted glass is translucent but not transparent, while ordinary glass and water are both translucent and transparent. Materials that are flat, very smooth and shiny, such as polished metals, reflect light in a special way. They not only reflect most of the light that falls on them, but also reflect it back in straight lines. They turn into mirrors, which reflect back a clear image of whatever object is in front of them. Most ordinary mirrors are sheets of glass with a silvery coating on the back. When an incoming light ray strikes the mirror at a certain angle, it's reflected off the mirror at the same angle. The perpendicular line from the point at which the ray strikes the mirror is called the normal. The angle between the incoming ray and the normal is called the angle of incidence, and the angle between the reflected ray and the normal is called the angle of reflection. The basic law of mirrors states that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. When you look in a mirror, you see what appears to be an accurate picture of yourself looking back. But the picture you see is not completely accurate. If you raise your right hand, your mirror image raises its left hand. If you turn your head to the left, your mirror image turns its head to the right. In a mirror image, right and left are reversed. The image of yourself you see in a mirror appears as far behind the mirror as you are in front. It looks real enough, but in fact it doesn't really exist. It's what we call a virtual image. You can't capture the image or project it onto a screen. The image in a plane or flat mirror is exactly the same size as the object that produces it. But if you curve the mirror, you can produce smaller or bigger images. The wing mirrors used on cars are curved. Their surface curves backwards from the centre like an upside down saucer. We call this a convex shape. When you look into a wing mirror, you see a smaller image of yourself and your surroundings. It is erect or the right way up and is virtual. Shaving or makeup mirrors curve in the opposite direction from wing mirrors. They have a surface that curves forwards from the middle, like a saucer. We call this a concave shape. When you look into the concave mirror from a close-up position, it produces a magnified image of your face. As with a plane mirror, the image is erect and virtual. But if you suddenly move back from the mirror, you notice that your image suddenly turns upside down. We say it becomes inverted. And if you hold a card in the right place, you can capture the image. In other words, it is a real image. Astronomers make use of this property of curved mirrors to form real images in reflecting telescopes. In about 1668, the English scientist Isaac Newton designed a new kind of telescope to overcome the colour distortions in the refracting or lens telescopes of the day. He used a curved mirror rather than a lens to gather the light. The common type of reflecting telescope or reflector used by amateur astronomers today still uses Newton's design. The Newtonian reflector has a large concave primary mirror to gather the starlight set at the base of an open tube. The mirror then reflects the light back up the telescope tube to a plane mirror angled at 45 degrees. This plane mirror in turn reflects the light through a right angle into an eyepiece set in the side of the tube. The eyepiece produces a magnified image of the star field viewed. The image is inverted or upside down, but for astronomical work, this doesn't matter. Larger reflecting telescopes have different mirror arrangements and are usually able to form images at different points. 
The prime focus position is the place above the primary mirror where the mirror forms a sharp image, that is, brings the light rays to a focus. Most photography is done in this prime focus position. The Cassegrain focus position is a point beneath the primary mirror. Light rays gathered by the concave primary mirror are reflected up the tube to a small convex mirror. This mirror then reflects the light back down the tube and through a hole in the primary mirror. There it is viewed through an eyepiece. All the major telescopes in the world are reflectors. This is because they can be built with large mirrors. The famous Hale Telescope of Palomar Observatory in the USA has a mirror over five metres across. Refraction is another basic property of light. It is the bending of a light ray that occurs when it travels from one transparent medium into another. Refraction takes place, for example, when a light ray travels from air into water, water into air, air into glass and glass into air. Refraction explains why a straw in a glass of lemonade looks bent when you look down on it, and if you look at it from the side, it looks broken. Both these effects occur because of the way light bends at the surface, the boundary between the air and the lemonade. Refraction also explains why water in a bath and swimming pool looks shallower than it really is. A basic law of refraction is that when a light ray travels from a less dense to a more dense medium, such as air into water, the refracted ray is bent towards the normal in the denser medium. Conversely, when a light ray travels from a more dense to a less dense medium, such as water to air, the refracted ray is bent away from the normal in the less dense medium. Different media, such as water, glass and clear plastic, bend light entering them by different amounts. It depends on an optical property called their refractive index. Just as curved reflecting surfaces can produce a variety of different images, real or virtual, erect or inverted, same size, smaller or magnified and so on, so can curved refracting surfaces. The most useful of these are the curved pieces of glass we call lenses. In general, a lens has two curved surfaces. Light is refracted, or bent, twice as it passes through each surface, from air to glass and from glass back into the air. As with curved mirrors, there are basically two types of lenses, concave and convex. Concave lenses have saucer-shaped surfaces and are thinnest in the middle. Convex lenses have the opposite shape, being thickest in the middle. These two types of opposite shaped lenses are also optical opposites. Because of the different curvature of the lens surfaces, light is bent in different directions as it passes through the two types of lenses. When a beam of light rays enters one side of a concave lens, the rays are bent away from the axis of the lens, an imaginary line passing through the middle of the lens. In other words, they spread out or diverge when they leave the other side of the lens. That's why we call the concave lens a diverging lens. On the other hand, when a beam of light enters one side of a convex lens, the rays are bent towards the axis. In other words, they come together or converge when they leave the other side of the lens. The convex lens is a converging lens. Of the two kinds of lenses, the convex lens is the most useful. When you look through a convex lens held close to an object, you see a magnified image of the object. This is the principle behind the simple magnifying glass. The magnified image is erect but virtual and is on the same side of the lens as the object. A convex lens will also produce a real image of a distant object which can be captured on a screen. The real image is inverted and on the opposite side of the lens to the object. Again, astronomers make use of this property to design telescopes to view the heavens more clearly. These telescopes are called refracting telescopes, or refractors. Historically, refractors were the first telescopes used. The Italian scientist Galileo made the first good refractor in 1609 and turned it on the heavens in the winter of that year. 
Among his startling discoveries were the four large moons of Jupiter, still called the Galilean moons, and the phases of Venus. These discoveries, among others, convinced him that Copernicus's revolutionary theory, 1543, that the Sun and not the Earth was the centre of the universe, was correct. One major drawback of the early refractors was that they were affected by colour blurring of the image. This chromatic aberration happens because the different colours, or wavelengths, that make up white light bend by differing amounts when they are refracted in the lens. Consequently, they are not all brought into focus at the same point. This results in blurring. Refractors can't be built in such large sizes as reflectors. You can build big reflectors because you can support a mirror from behind, but you can only support a lens at the sides, which sets up stresses and causes distortion as the size and weight of the lens increases. Consequently, the biggest refractor at Yerkes University in the USA has a lens only about one meter across. Rockets. When we want to launch a satellite into space, we install it in a rocket and fire it into the heavens. Why do we use rockets to launch spacecraft? Why don't we use, for example, the jet engines we use to power aircraft instead? The main reason we can't use a jet engine is it needs air to work. It draws in air as it travels through the atmosphere and uses this to burn its fuel or rather it uses the oxygen in the air to burn its fuel. Because there's no air in space, jet engines can't work there. Nor can petrol or diesel engines. Like jets, these engines burn their fuel in oxygen they take in from the atmosphere. Also, jet, petrol and diesel engines are nowhere near powerful enough to launch bodies into space against the pull of Earth's gravity. At present, we know of only one kind of engine that can work in space, the rocket. This is because a rocket carries not only fuel, but also the oxygen to burn the fuel. It does not depend on outside air. Therefore, it can work in the vacuum of space. And by selecting the right fuels, rockets can be made powerful enough to beat gravity and launch bodies into space. As the gases shoot out backwards, the motor is thrust forwards. This follows from the principle of reaction, that a force in one direction is balanced by an equal force in the opposite direction. The English genius Isaac Newton first stated this principle as his third law of motion. To every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Rockets are often called reaction engines. The fuel and oxidizer in a rocket are called its propellants because when they burn, they produce the gases to propel the rocket. The propulsive force developed by a rocket is called its thrust. The simplest kinds of rockets use new solid propellants. The original, original rocket, invented by the Chinese about 900 years ago, used gunpowder as a solid propellant. We still use this in our fireworks rockets today. It is a combination of powdered charcoal, sulphur, and saltpetre, or potassium nitrate. Charcoal, a form of carbon, and sulphur make up the fuel, and saltpetre is the oxidizer. In a firework rocket, the nose contains chemicals to produce coloured stars and streamers. The gunpowder is packed into a cardboard tube which forms the combustion chamber. At the rear of the tube is a twist of chemically treated touch paper which acts as a fuse. The tube is attached to a long stick, which helps the rocket to travel straight. To set off the rocket, you light the touch paper. This ignites the gunpowder and produces a stream of hot gases. This shoots out of the open end of the tube and propels the rocket into the sky. The solid propellant rockets used for spaceflight have much the same basic design as the firework rocket. They consist of a tube, packed with propellant, with a shaped nozzle at the rear, through which the hot gases escape. But, instead of the propellants burning from the rear forwards, they burn radially, or outwards from the centre. The propellant charge has a hole through the middle. This forms the space for combustion to take place. The charge is set alight by an igniter. Once ignited, 
It cannot be put out. The solid propellants used in space rockets are much more powerful than gunpowder. They typically consist of a mixture of powdered aluminium and ammonium perchlorate, the oxidizer, in a binder of synthetic rubber. This propellant mix is used, for example, in the solid rocket boosters fitted to the space shuttle. Mostly, however, space launch vehicles are powered by liquid propellant rockets. These are easier to control than solid ones. They can be throttled up or down or shut off and restarted. Liquid propellant rockets are much more complicated than solid ones. They have separate tanks to carry the fuel and the oxidizer. These propellants are pumped separately into a combustion chamber where they mix and are ignited. The hot gases produced escape at high speed through the shaped exhaust nozzle. Naturally, the combustion chamber and nozzle get very hot as the propellants burn. 3000 degrees Celsius or more. To prevent the metal walls melting, they are cooled by incoming fuel. This is channeled through the walls of the chamber and nozzle or surrounding pipes before it is fed into the combustion chamber. This arrangement is called regenerative cooling. It also improves the efficiency of combustion by preheating the fuel. Liquid rockets contain many subsidiary systems to make them work. For example, the turbo pumps that pump the propellants are themselves powered by gas produced in a gas generator. Gas is also fed into the propellant tanks to keep them pressurised as they empty, and numerous valves are located in the propellant delivery system to control the flow to the combustion chamber, and thus the thrust developed by the rocket. The commonest liquid propellants used in early space rockets were kerosene as fuel and liquid oxygen as oxidizer. This combination was used in the first stage of the Saturn V rocket and is still used in the vehicles that launch Russia's Soyuz and Progress spacecraft. A much more powerful combination of liquid propellants is liquid hydrogen fuel and liquid oxygen oxidizer. These are known as cryogenic propellants because they have a very low temperature liquid hydrogen minus 253 degrees Celsius, liquid oxygen minus 183 degrees Celsius. The Space Shuttle main engines use these propellants. When they burn, they do so with a bluish, nearly transparent flame. The resulting gas is water vapour and is non-polluting. This certainly can't be said of the filthy exhausts from the Shuttle's solid boosters. To make a rocket more powerful, we must make it burn more fuel. But the more fuel it has to carry, the bigger and heavier it has to be, and the more dead weight it has to carry in its structure. So a mammoth rocket might develop tremendous power on the launch pad, but it could never make it into space. The father of aeronautics, the Russian schoolmaster Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, appreciated this power-to-weight problem at the turn of this century long before the days of spaceflight. He also saw the solution. Instead of using one huge rocket to launch a body into space, we use a number of smaller rockets joined together. Each rocket fires in turn and then falls away, progressively making the rocket lighter and lighter. This principle is known as the step rocket. Each separate rocket is known as a stage, first stage, second stage and so on. The whole rocket combination is known as a launch vehicle. In most space launch vehicles, the rocket stages are linked together end to end. This arrangement is known as tandem staging. Three stages are usual, with the third stage carrying the payload or cargo. On the launch pad, the lower first stage fires first, carrying the stages above it piggyback into the air. When the first stage runs out of fuel, it separates and falls away. The second stage then fires, thrusting the now smaller and lighter rocket faster and faster.
In turn, this second stage runs out of fuel, separates and falls away. The third stage fires until what is left of the launch vehicle is travelling fast enough to go into orbit. In orbit, the payload separates from the third stage and becomes an independent satellite. Some launch vehicles carry additional rockets, which provide extra power at liftoff. They are attached to the first stage of the main, or core, vehicle and are called strap-ons or boosters. Ariane 3 and 4 launch vehicles use strap-on boosters. So does that veteran workhorse, the Delta launch vehicle. This has no less than nine solid strap-ons. Six fire on liftoff, three later. The main core vehicle of Delta uses just two stages. This sequence shows a Delta launch. The satellite depicted is UV, NASA's Extreme Ultraviolet Explorer satellite. It is housed during launch inside a fairing which gives it protection during its passage through the atmosphere. After insertion into orbit, the fairing is jettisoned. Then the satellite's solar panels unfold and start feeding electricity to the onboard instruments. The third stage remains in orbit, part of the useless junk now accumulating in space. Ordinary launchers like Ariane and Delta can be used only once. They are called Expendable Launch Vehicles or ELVs. Historically, the most famous launch vehicle was the Saturn V moon rocket. It was the brainchild of the legendary Werner von Braun who developed the ancestor of all modern space rockets, the V2. The Saturn V stood 111 metres high on the launch pad and tipped the scales at some 3,000 tonnes. This colossal vehicle was needed to send three man crews to the moon and on the Apollo moon landing missions of the 1960s and 70s. 111 metres of hardware left the launch pad. All that returned was a capsule a few metres high. The American Space Shuttle is a different type entirely because it is reusable. It is essentially a single stage vehicle with twin strap-on solid rocket boosters. The boosters fire for two minutes before separating. They parachute back to Earth and are recovered to be used again. The winged orbiter, carrying crew and payload, forms the main stage. Its engines fire all the way into orbit. 
It takes fuel from a separate external tank, which is jettisoned when empty. The tank is the only part of the shuttle that is not used again. Satellites and Orbits The Earth's pull, or the force of gravity, is very powerful, so how can we overcome it and send bodies into space? In our normal experience, what goes up must come down. If you throw a ball into the air, it travels up a short way and then arcs over and falls back to Earth, pulled back by gravity. But the harder you throw the ball, the faster and farther it travels before gravity pulls it back to Earth. This gives us a clue as to how to beat gravity and send a body into space by speed. Imagine you are on a very high mountain and can throw a ball at any speed parallel with the ground. If you throw the ball at, say, 2,000 kilometres an hour, about the speed of a bullet, it will travel quite a long way before falling back to the ground. If you throw it at 10,000 kilometres an hour, it will travel way over the horizon before returning to the ground. The faster you throw it, the farther it travels. But, when you throw the ball at a speed of 28,000 kilometres an hour, a strange thing happens. The ball curves around the Earth and comes back to you, staying the same height above the ground. It has become a satellite of the Earth. The ball is still gripped by gravity and is still falling towards the Earth, but is travelling so fast that the amount it falls towards the Earth is the same as the amount the Earth's surface curves away beneath it, and so it, in effect, stays at the same height above the ground. We say it is in a state of free fall. So, to launch a body into space then, we must boost it to a speed of some 28,000 kilometres an hour in a direction parallel with the ground. It will then travel round and round the Earth at the same height as a satellite. But we must make sure that the body is launched high enough so that it is above the Earth's atmosphere. Then there is no air resistance to slow it down, so it remains lapping the Earth at the same speed. We call the path a satellite takes through space its orbit, and the speed it must have to remain in orbit is called the orbital velocity. The orbital velocity varies according to the height of the satellite's orbit. It gets lower as the orbit gets higher. This is because gravity gets weaker as distance from the Earth increases. In other words, the satellite does not have to travel so fast to overcome it. The orbital velocity quoted earlier, 28,000 kilometres an hour, is for an orbit about 150 kilometres high. For a satellite in an orbit 1,500 kilometres high, the orbital velocity is less than 26,000 kilometres an hour. In an orbit 150 kilometres high, a satellite takes less than 90 minutes to circle the Earth once. 
This length of time is called the orbital period. Normally, the orbital period of a satellite varies according to the height of its orbit. It increases with increasing height. This is because the orbit is longer and the satellite is travelling more slowly in it. So, at a height of 1,500 kilometres, the orbital period has increased to nearly two hours. At a height of 15,000 kilometres, the orbital period is nine hours. At a height of 35,900 kilometres, it is no less than 24 hours. At a height of 385,000 kilometres, the orbital period of a satellite would be 27 and a third days. In fact, there is a satellite of the Earth at that height, and with this orbital period. It is the Earth's only natural satellite, the Moon. The Moon obeys just the same rules as man-made satellites. The height at which a satellite circles the Earth also determines how long it will remain in orbit. Satellites orbiting at heights of a few hundred kilometres will fall back to Earth in a matter of years. This is because there are still minute traces of air at such heights, and eventually these traces slow down the satellites. They drop lower and lower until their speed drops below orbital velocity. Then they succumb to gravity and plummet back to Earth. As they re-enter the fringes of the atmosphere, travelling at nearly 28,000 kilometres an hour, friction with the air generates large amounts of heat. This causes them to burn up like meteors. As satellites are launched into higher orbits, so their life expectancy increases to decades and centuries. It's estimated that the small, dense satellite LAGIOS-1, launched in 1976 into a 6,000 kilometre high orbit, will remain in orbit for 10 million years. By then, the map of the world will look quite different because of the drift of the continents. To inform any Earth people who may find LAGIOS in 10 million years' time, it carries a pictorial message telling them when and where it was launched. The time scale is indicated in binary code. The three maps show 1. the Earth 270 million years ago, 2. the continents today, and 3. the continents as they will look in 10 million years. Space scientists choose the orbit for a particular satellite according to what work it will perform in space. Many weather satellites, for example, are launched into an orbit that takes them over the north and south poles. In this polar orbit, a satellite travels around the Earth while the Earth spins beneath it. It thus views a different part of the surface each orbit and scans the whole Earth every 12 hours. Some satellites circle in an orbit that takes them over the equator, in an equatorial orbit. International communications satellites are launched into an equatorial orbit 35,900 kilometres high. If you remember, in an orbit at this height, a satellite takes 24 hours to make one revolution. Think what happens when a satellite is launched into such an orbit so that it travels over the equator and in the same direction that the Earth is travelling. It circles once round the Earth in 24 hours, but the Earth itself rotates on its axis in 24 hours. So, relative to the Earth, the satellite appears to be stationary in the sky. For this reason, this 35,900 kilometre high equatorial orbit is called a geostationary orbit.
The geostationary communication satellites of the International Intelsat Network operate from three locations above the equator over the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Oceans. From these vantage points, spaced roughly 120 degrees apart around the globe, they can relay communications between most countries. Geostationary satellites travel in the plane of the Earth's equator. Most other satellites travel in an orbit at an angle to the plane of the equator. This angle is called the orbital inclination. An orbital inclination of a few degrees indicates that a satellite is travelling close to the equator. An orbital inclination of nearly 90 degrees indicates that it is travelling close to the poles. Geostationary satellites also travel in a circular orbit, remaining the same height above the ground. Most satellites, however, travel in an orbit in the shape of an ellipse, which takes them closer to Earth at some times than at others. The point in an orbit nearest to the Earth is called the perigee, the point farthest away, the apogee. The greater the difference between the perigee and apogee, the more elongated or eccentric is the orbit. The term orbital eccentricity describes the amount of elongation. It is the difference between perigee and apogee divided by the distance between them, the major axis. A circular orbit, apogee equals perigee, has an orbital eccentricity of zero. Let's look at the orbital characteristics of a practical satellite, such as the Russian Molniya communications satellite. The orbital inclination is about 63 degrees. The perigee is about 450 kilometers in the southern hemisphere. The apogee is about 40,000 kilometers in the northern hemisphere. The orbital eccentricity is about 0 0.75. This orbit is chosen so that the satellite spends most of its orbit in northern skies where it is above the horizon for ground stations in Russia's satellite communications networks. The beginning and end of space. We think we now know quite accurately what the universe is like. It consists of a vast expanse of space in which matter is dotted about in the form of galaxies. Each galaxy, spiralling around like a giant Catherine wheel, is made up of billions of stars which are like our sun. And many of these stars almost certainly have planets circling around them, much as our sun has and the likelihood is that some of these planets are inhabited by different kinds of life forms. Just how old is this universe of ours? Well, by studying the rocks we know how old the Earth is, about 4,600 million years. So this is also presumably the age of the Sun and the rest of the solar system. But suns are being born all the time in space so the universe would be expected to be more than 4,600 million years old. To find out how old, astronomers look at distant galaxies. They find that all the galaxies are rushing away, away from us and away from each other, and the farther they are away, the faster they are moving. It appears that the whole of space is getting bigger. This idea is known as the expanding universe. If the universe is expanding, this means that in the past it was smaller and its matter was packed much more tightly together. And in theory, if we go back in time far enough, we should reach a time when all the matter in the universe was concentrated in one spot. And broadly speaking, that is what astronomers think happened. They think it happened about 15,000 million years ago. Astronomers reckon 
that 15,000 million years ago all the matter and energy in the universe was created and the universe started to expand in a gigantic explosion they call the Big Bang. The Big Bang didn't just create matter and energy, it created space as well. It also created time. There was no matter, energy, space or time until the Big Bang. We can't talk about before the Big Bang because time didn't exist until the Big Bang. At the instant of the Big Bang, the universe was infinitely hot and full only of energy. But in seconds, the universe had expanded and cooled down enough for the energy to be transformed into atomic particles, such as protons, neutrons and electrons. After a few minutes, as the temperature fell further, the particles began to join together to form atomic nuclei, notably nuclei of helium. It took several hundred thousand years before the atomic nuclei and the electrons were able to join together to form atoms. The protons combined with electrons to form hydrogen, the helium nuclei to form helium. Hydrogen and helium are still the most powerful elements in the universe even today. Hydrogen is the main fuel stars burn to produce energy to keep shining. The universe continued to expand and cool down. Much later, after perhaps 2,000 million years, clouds of hydrogen and helium gases began to collapse under gravity and form the first stars and galaxies. Star and galaxy formation has been going on ever since creating the universe as it is today. But what of the future? No one, of course, can predict what the future holds, but there seem two possible options. It depends on whether we live in an open or closed universe. If the universe is open, the galaxies will continue to rush headlong through space, resulting in a universe of ever-increasing size. This will continue until all the stars and galaxies die and fade away billions upon billions of years hence. However, if there is enough matter in the universe, the gravity associated with this matter will in time start to slow down the galaxies and the expansion of the universe. This is the idea of the closed universe. There does not appear to be enough visible matter in the universe to make it closed, but it is possible that there is a lot of matter we can't see called dark matter. If so, then the universe might well be closed. A closed universe will one day stop expanding and indeed start to contract. All the galaxies will start moving closer together, the reverse of what is observed to be happening at the present. The closed universe will continue to shrink, smaller and smaller, until all its matter will be squeezed into a single point the universe will then disappear in an event that astronomers call the Big Crunch. The Big Crunch would be the opposite of the Big Bang and signal the end of the universe. Or would it? The Big Crunch could well trigger off another Big Bang which would create a new universe. This new universe would expand creating stars and galaxies like the ones we see today then that universe might end in another big crunch to be followed by still another big bang. This idea of a continuous cycle of expansion and contraction of big bang and big crunch is known as the oscillating universe. The scale of space. Everything that exists makes up what we call the universe. Broadly speaking, 
The universe is made up of matter, energy and space. The earth and everything on it, rocks, air, water, plants, humans, form part of the matter of the universe. So do the other planets, the moon, the sun and the stars we see in the night sky. All these forms of matter float in, or rather travel through, space. But exactly how big is space? Is the universe? When we look up at the night sky, we are peering into a tiny part of the universe. It is occupied by stars seemingly suspended in the inky blackness of space. Through our telescopes, no matter how powerful they are, the stars always appear only as tiny points of light. Yet we know that the stars are in reality other suns, great balls of searing hot gas a million kilometers or more in diameter. So, as they show only as tiny points, the stars must lie far, far away. And so they do. Astronomers tell us that even the nearest stars lie more than 40 million million kilometers away. And the farthest star systems or galaxies we can see in powerful telescopes lie thousands of millions of times farther away still. Such distances are more than the human mind can grasp or even imagine. So to the question, how big is the universe? We must reply, bigger than we can ever imagine. We can get a rough idea of the scale of the universe if we take an imaginary trip in a spaceship starting from Earth and travelling out through the solar system to the stars and beyond. But an ordinary rocket craft like the space shuttle is no good. It is far too slow. We must ride in a super spaceship that can travel at the highest speed possible. This is the speed of light. Light travels at a speed of about 300,000 kilometers a second, or 1,080 million kilometers an hour. Science fiction stories and films feature starships propelled by photon rockets, which achieve the speed of light by beaming intense light rays from their engines. The Star Trek adventure series features the best known of these, the starship Enterprise. NASA called the first prototype space shuttle orbiter Enterprise in its honour. We start out from Earth and visit the Moon first. The 385,000 kilometre lunar journey at the speed of light is over in a blink of an eye, taking a little over a second. We next aim for the Sun, nearly 150 million kilometres away. We get there in eight and a half minutes. From there, we venture forth to the planet Pluto in the outskirts of the solar system. We reach the planet, currently about 4,400 million kilometers away, in just four hours. The journey to Proxima Centauri takes not just hours, nor days, nor months, but years. In fact, about four years and three months. 4.28 years. That's how long it has taken us travelling at the speed of light to cover the distance just to the nearest star. And of course, that is also the time it takes light from the star to reach the Earth. So we can say that from Earth the star is 4.28 years away, travelling at the speed of light. And we can also say that it lies at a distance 4.28 times the distance light travels in a year. Astronomers use the distance light travels in a year as a convenient unit for measuring distances in space. They term it the light year. 
it's equal to about 9.5 million million kilometers. Using this unit, distances in space become easier to express. So Proxima Centauri is 4.28 light years away, which is easier to grasp than saying it's 40 million million kilometers away. From Proxima Centauri, one of the dimmest stars in our night sky, we travel to one of the brightest, Deneb in the constellation Cygnus, the Swan. To reach this brilliant supergiant star, takes over 1,600 years. Yet Deneb is still a near neighbour in the star system or galaxy that we inhabit. Our galaxy, which is called the Milky Way, measures no less than 100,000 light years across, so it would take us 100,000 years to travel from one side to the other. When we consider travelling to the other galaxies, the distances and our times of travel increase by leaps and bounds. It would take us 170,000 years to reach the nearest galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. It would take over two million years to travel to the Andromeda Galaxy, and this is still a neighbour as far as the universe is concerned. Only if we journeyed for some 15,000 million years from Earth would we reach the most distant heavenly bodies we can see in the night sky, and that is the same time that has passed since the universe was created. The Sun and its family. Every day at dawn the Sun rises over the eastern horizon and climbs into the morning sky, bringing light to our world. At noon the Sun reaches its highest point in the sky, then in the afternoon it begins to descend. In the evening at sunset the Sun disappears over the western horizon. Darkness falls and the sky will remain dark until dawn next day. The Sun then travels from east to west around the Earth. But this is not what really happens. In fact, the Sun remains in the same spot in space. Its movement across the sky is caused by the Earth spinning round in space. The Earth spins round on its axis once every 24 hours, travelling towards the east. On the Earth, we don't think we're moving. We think that the Sun is moving instead, in the opposite direction towards the West. The Earth's period of rotation, the time it takes to spin or rotate once on its axis, is one of our basic units of time, the day. At night, if you remain stargazing for any length of time, you can see the stars travelling in arcing paths across the heavens from east to west. This too happens because the Earth is spinning on its axis. The Earth has another motion in space. It travels in an endless path or orbit that carries it round and round the Sun. It takes 365 and a quarter days to travel round the Sun once. This is its period of revolution round the Sun, a period we call a year. The Earth does not spin upright in space as it travels around the Sun. That is, its axis is not perpendicular to the plane of its orbit. Its axis is tilted at an angle of 23.5 degrees. The Earth's axis is always tilted in the same direction in space. This means that, as the Earth travels each year around the Sun, the axis is tilted alternately towards, then away from, the Sun. 
Naturally, when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, the southern hemisphere is tilted away and vice versa. The tilt of the Earth's axis has a marked effect on the climate in most parts of the world, creating what we call the seasons. There are four main seasons, summer, autumn, winter and spring. The temperature varies in each season depending on how much a place is tilted towards or away from the sun. It is midsummer in a place when it is tilted most towards the sun. It is midwinter when the place is tilted most away from the sun. In the Northern Hemisphere, midsummer is on June the 21st and midwinter is on December the 21st. In the Southern Hemisphere, midsummer is on December the 21st and midwinter on June the 21st. Between summer and winter is autumn, marked by a point in the Earth's orbit when the axis tilts neither towards nor away from the sun. And between winter and summer is spring, marked again by a point at which the Earth's axis tilts neither towards nor away from the sun. These points in the Earth's orbit are known as the equinoxes, because then the lengths of day and night are equal throughout the world. In the Northern Hemisphere, the autumn equinox occurs on September the 23rd and the spring equinox on March the 21st each year. Again, the seasons are reversed in the Southern Hemisphere. The Earth is not the only large body to circle around the Sun in space. There are another eight bodies that do so, the planets. They all orbit at different distances from the Sun. In order, going outwards from the Sun, they are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. The planets circle the Sun and travel with it through space. They form the major part of the Sun's family, or solar system. The Sun is quite a different kind of body from the planets. It is our local star, which generates enormous energy in its interior. We see it shine as it radiates heat and light into space. We also see the planets shine in the night sky, but they shine only because they reflect sunlight. They produce no light themselves. The planets are all of different sizes. The diagram shows them drawn to scale. The Earth is quite a small planet. It's dwarfed by the four giant planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. In turn, the giant planets are dwarfed by the Sun itself. Its diameter is nearly 1,400,000 kilometres. This is almost 10 times the diameter of Jupiter and more than 100 times the diameter of the Earth. Mercury, Venus and Mars are rocky planets like the Earth and are often called the terrestrial or Earth-like planets. The four giant planets are quite different, having deep atmospheres above deep oceans of liquid gas, mainly hydrogen. The four inner planets lie relatively close together, but the remaining ones lie very far apart. This diagram shows the orbits of these inner ones roughly to scale. Mercury orbits at an average distance from the Sun of about 58 million kilometres. Mars is an average distance of about 228 million kilometres. The Earth orbits at a distance of about 150 million kilometres, a distance astronomers call an astronomical unit, AU.
This diagram concentrates on the orbits of the outer planets. The orbit of Mars is shown to scale in the middle. Pluto is the planet that travels farthest from the Sun, more than 7,000 million kilometres away at times. It lies about 40 times as far away as the Earth, or 40 AU. Note that all the planets circle the Sun in the same direction as the Earth. Viewed from the north of the solar system, the planets circle the Sun in an anti-clockwise direction. Most of the planets orbit in much the same plane as the Earth. The two exceptions are Mercury, whose orbit is angled at about 7 degrees, and Pluto, whose orbit is angled 10 degrees more. We say that the planets circle the Sun, but this is not strictly true. They do not travel in circles around the Sun, but in ellipses. The German astronomer Johannes Kepler first stated this in the early 1600s as his first law of planetary motion. The Sun is at one focus of the elliptical orbit, and the distance of planet to the Sun varies throughout the orbit. The point at which it is closest to the Sun is called the perihelion, and the farthest is called the aphelion. The orbits of most of the planets deviate little from a circle. The orbit of the Earth deviates from a circle by less than 2%. Mercury and Pluto, however, have highly elliptical or eccentric orbits. For example, at perihelion, Pluto lies less than 4,500 million kilometres from the Sun and edges inside the orbit of Neptune. It lies inside Neptune's orbit at present. But at aphelion, 120 years later, it lies over 7,300 million kilometres out. Like the Earth, the planets spin on their axis. Again viewed from the north of the solar system, all except Venus spin anticlockwise like the Earth. Venus has a slow clockwise or retrograde rotation. Mars has a tilt nearly identical with that of Earth. This means that the planet therefore experiences seasons, as, in turn, its northern, then its southern hemisphere, tilt towards, then away from the Sun. This brings about seasonal changes in temperature in the Martian climate. The tilt in the axes of more distant planets has little effect on their climate because of the weakness of the sunlight at such distances. The planet with the most pronounced axial tilt is Uranus. Its axis is tilted over at over 97 degrees, more than a right angle. This means that it spins more or less on its side with its axis nearly parallel to its orbital plane. With the exception of Mercury and Venus, the planets travel through space with one or more companions. The Earth has one such companion, the Moon. The Moon is the Earth's natural satellite. Mars has two satellites, or moons. Between them, the giant planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune have at least 61 moons. Saturn alone has at least 22. These planets are indeed themselves miniature solar systems. Most of the moons circle their planets in anti-clockwise orbits, but a few have clockwise or retrograde orbit. The planets and their moons are the main bodies in the solar system, but there are other bodies besides. Between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, a ring of rocky bodies, large and small, it circles the Sun. It makes up what we call the asteroid belt. Other members of the solar system pay fleeting visits to Earth's skies. They are the ice-covered rocky bodies we know as comets. From time to time, they travel in towards the Sun. As they get nearer, the Sun heats them up and makes them release clouds of dust and gas. The clouds reflect sunlight, making the comets visible. The pressure of the solar wind, 
a stream of particles given out by the sun, forces the gas and dust into a tail, which always points away from the sun. Swarms of other rocky matter travel in the space between the planets, much of it the debris shed by passing comets. Tiny rocky particles shower down on the earth all the time, burning up as they plunge into the air. At night we see them as the fiery streaks we call meteors, which we popularly call shooting or falling stars. Large chunks of rock create spectacular fireballs and may reach the ground intact as meteorites. It was a meteorite weighing maybe as much as a million tons that created the famous Arizona meteor crater in the Arizona desert when it slammed into the earth some 25,000 years ago. That's one small step for a man one giant leap for mankind. Surely those are among the most famous words in history, spoken by Neil Armstrong as he stepped onto the lunar Sea of Tranquility in July 1969. The bridge between the two worlds had been finally crossed. Apollo was a technical triumph, and also a triumph for human courage. Remember Apollo 13, when an explosion on the outward journey crippled the spacecraft, and they needed luck as well as skill to bring the astronauts home. Apollo 17, in December 1972, marked the end of the series. So what did it achieve? Scientifically, of course, it was invaluable. We now know far more about the Moon, and hence about the Earth, than we did before Apollo. But above all, it showed that men can reach other worlds. And we must remember, too, that the Moon had to be our first port of call, simply because it's so near, and because it always stays with us as we travel around the Sun. A lunar colony is now a real possibility within the next decade or two. It will be scientific, and the benefits will be immense. Consider, for example, the medical research that will be possible there. And that's only one of the legacies of Apollo. The three Apollo astronauts will travel to the Moon, start their perilous journey atop a mammoth rocket, Saturn V the biggest and most powerful rocket there's ever been. On the launch pad, it stands no less than 111 metres tall. It weighs 3,000 tonnes. The astronauts are lying in couches in the Apollo spacecraft, at the very tip of the rocket. They're in the main part of the Apollo spacecraft, the CSM, Command and Service Modules. Underneath is the Lunar Module, the craft that will actually put down on the Moon's surface. Above them is the Escape Tower, which will pull them clear during a launch emergency. The countdown comes to an end. The first stage engines of the Saturn V ignite as kerosene and oxygen burn and send pillars of flame from the engine nozzles. The colossal rocket slowly lifts off the launch pad. The noise is ear-splitting. The ground is vibrating. When the first stage fuel tanks are empty, the engines cut off and the first stage falls away. The second stage engines then fire, thrusting the now lighter rocket faster and faster. In turn, the second stage runs out of fuel and falls away, and the third stage fires. When what remains of the Apollo Saturn V launch vehicle reaches Earth orbit, the third stage engine shuts off. In this parking orbit, all spacecraft systems and flight path data are checked and rechecked. Then the third stage is reignited, boosting the Apollo spacecraft to near escape velocity and into a trajectory that will take it to the Moon. Next comes some delicate manoeuvring to get the Apollo spacecraft into the correct configuration for the journey to the Moon. First, the CSM separates from the third stage, turns round, and then heads back in, nose first, to dock with the lunar module. When docked, it withdraws the lunar module from the third stage shroud and pulls it clear. As the Apollo spacecraft nears the Moon, lunar gravity speeds it up. When only about 100 kilometers above the surface, the CSM fires its main engine as a brake, allowing Apollo to go into lunar orbit. At the appropriate point in the orbit, the lunar module, with two astronauts on board, separates from the CSM and drops down towards the lunar surface. 
Because there's no air on the moon to slow it down, the lunar module fires its engines as a brake, and then it settles gently on the surface on its spidery landing legs. After exploring the surface, the two moonwalkers return to the lunar module. They take off in the upper half, the ascent stage, using the lower one, the descent stage, as a launch pad. They ascend into lunar orbit, where they rendezvous and dock with the CSM, which had been orbiting above them all the while. The two moonwalkers rejoin their colleague in the CSM. The main engine is then fired to thrust them out of lunar orbit and into a trajectory that will take them back to Earth. As Apollo approaches the Earth, its speed builds up to nearly 40,000 kilometers per hour. Just before re-entry into the atmosphere, the service module is jettisoned. The command module slams into the thicker and thicker air and quickly slows down. Its heat shield glows red-hot because of air friction and starts to melt away. In so doing, it dissipates the heat, ensuring that the astronauts inside stay cool. A few kilometers above the Earth, parachutes deploy above the command module and break it further for a gentle splashdown in the ocean. This small, blackened cone is all that remains of the 111 meters of pristine hardware that set out for the moon less than two weeks before. Europe's initial part in the space programs was somewhat muted. It wasn't possible for any European country to launch probes on the scale which could be achieved in America and the Soviet Union, though of course it was true that European technology was widely used. The situation today is different, with a proper launching ground, a Kourou in French Guyana, and a major program of building spacecraft as well as launching them. For example, it was a European probe, Giotto, which alone went through the head of Halley's Comet in 1986 and sent back the only close-range pictures of a cometary nucleus. The European Space Agency is now playing a leading part in all programmes and it's hoped that this involvement will increase still further in the near future. The Russians led the way in the early days of space research. They were the first to launch an artificial satellite, the first to send a man into space, the first to send rockets to the moon, and the first to attempt interplanetary probes. It was a Russian, Alexei Leonov, who achieved the first space walk. The Russians have sent sample and return probes to the moon and have obtained pictures from the surface of Venus. Yet they've also had their failures, notably their program of manned lunar flight in the 1960s. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the whole situation has changed. Baikonur, the main rocket ground, is in Kazakhstan. Star City, where the cosmonauts are trained, is near Moscow. Finance has become a problem. It's no longer possible for an official in the Kremlin to write a blank check. It's not easy to see how all this will affect the space program. We may hope for increased cooperation with the rest of the world. And for the moment at least, work at Baikonur and the other Russian space centers continues as normally as is possible under the new conditions. What exactly is a satellite, or artificial satellite as we should really call it? Well, it's any vehicle that can be sent above the top of the Earth's resisting atmosphere. Satellites of many kinds. Perhaps the most useful are communication satellites, which relay around the world telephone and fax messages, television programs, radio signals and so on. Weather satellites help in weather forecasting and help track dangerous tropical storms so that people in affected areas can be warned in time. Among the other kinds of satellites that bring us benefits are Earth Resources satellites, which monitor the Earth, telling us about Earth geography and geology, and helping us prospect for minerals and oil. Astronomical satellites give astronomers clearer eyes by lofting instruments above the Earth's atmosphere, where they can also study incoming radiations from space that never reach the ground. And of course, there are the manned satellites, space stations that are Russia's Mir, which have been the home of many cosmonauts, some of whom have remained in space for a year. Soon, NASA will start constructing Space Station Freedom, in which an international crew will carry out continuous space research. Oh yes, 
satellites are here to stay. And it seems astonishing to reflect that the space age began less than four decades ago when the Russians launched Sputnik 1 on October the 4th, 1957. The Earth is a member of the Sun's family. It's a junior member, one of nine planets, of which four are giants. The Sun itself is dominant. It's an ordinary star, astronomers even relegate it to the status of a dwarf, but it's still large enough to contain more than a million globes the volume of the Earth. It shines by its own energy and has been described as a vast, controlled nuclear reactor. The planets are divided into two groups. First come four relatively small bodies, Mercury, Venus, the Earth and Mars. Beyond the path, or orbit, of Mars move many thousands of midget worlds called minor planets or asteroids. Further out come the giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, plus a curious little world, Pluto, which seems to be something of a maverick. Most of the planets have satellites. The Earth has one, our faithful moon. Saturn has at least 18. And in the solar system, we also meet erratic bodies, such as comets and meteoroids, plus a surprisingly large quantity of interplanetary dust. Space probes are vehicles that can be sent to the moon or planets, even comets and asteroids. Perhaps the most successful of all has been Voyager 2, launched in 1977, which explored all the four giant planets, ending with Neptune in 1989. Voyager 2 marked the end of the first phase of planetary exploration, which began with Mariner 2, which bypassed Venus in 1962. Since then, all the planets have been surveyed from close range, apart from Pluto. The discoveries which have been made are spectacular. Mercury has a cratered landscape, not unlike that of the Moon. Venus is a fiercely hot world which has suffered a runaway greenhouse effect. On Mars, there is a huge valley, 5,000 kilometres long. And Io, one of Jupiter's satellites, has active sulphur volcanoes which are erupting all the time. All in all, the space probes have told us more about the planets during the last 30 years than we've been able to learn over the previous 30 centuries. The most successful probe there has ever been began its incredible journey in August 1977, when it was blasted into space by a Titan Centaur rocket. Ahead of it was a trip that would take 12 years and carry it 7,000 million kilometres to the outermost planet in the solar system. Voyager 2 survived its first main hurdle when it successfully passed through the asteroid belt, a band of mini planets and boulders circling between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And it was Jupiter that was Voyager's first target. It reached this giant planet in the summer of 1979, photographing its colourful atmosphere, peering at the ring its sister car Voyager 1 had discovered, and looking closely at some of the Jovian moons, including the volcanic Io. As Voyager skimmed past Jupiter, the giant planet's gravity accelerated it and flung it into a new trajectory that would, in two years' time, take it on to its next target, Saturn. This gravity assist maneuver would be repeated at each planet Voyager visited. The journey to Saturn took another two years, and Voyager passed closest to the planet in August 1981. Like Voyager 1 before it, the probe examined Saturn's magnificent rings in great detail trying to fathom the mysterious spokes, for example, and looking at the tiny shepherd moons that keep the ring particles in place. Then Voyager passed through the plane of the rings, and a further gravity assist maneuver sent it precisely into the correct trajectory to the next planet, Uranus, a mysterious distant world never before visited by a space probe. Voyager approached closer to Uranus in January 1986, sending back signals that, because of the enormous distance, took two and three quarter hours to reach us. Uranus revealed itself as a rather featureless, bluish-green planet. 
The biggest surprise is Uranus, with the appearance of its moon, Miranda, which has a landscape totally unlike anything yet encountered in the solar system. It looks as if the moon was once blasted apart in a catastrophic collision, and then reformed, producing the incredible landscape we see. A third gravity assist manoeuvre thrust Voyager towards its fourth and final port of call, the planet Neptune. At a distance of some 4,500 million kilometres, Voyager's radio signals took over four hours to reach us when it made its closest approach to Neptune. Just after its twelfth birthday, Voyager swooped within 5,000 kilometres of Neptune's cloud tops. It was the closest flyby of them all, and an incredible feat after a 12-year, 7 billion kilometre journey. Before leaving Neptune, Voyager zeroed in on the moon Triton, discovering this to be a deep frozen world, dotted with geysers, pouring out nitrogen vapour and ice. Like its sister craft, Voyager 2 is still reporting on conditions in deep space as it heads out of the solar system toward the stars. It's heading toward the constellation Canis Major, the Great Dog. In about 300,000 years' time, it shall pass fairly close to Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. One problem about space research has always been its cost. Launching a spacecraft with an ordinary rocket is wasteful, because it can be used only once. It's rather like building a new plane for every plane journey between London and New York. That's why the Space Shuttle was designed. It takes off from a launch pad like a rocket, flies in space like a spacecraft, and lands on a runway like a glider. The main part of the shuttle, the orbiter, can be used time and time again. So can its twin booster rockets. Only its fuel tank is expendable. It's true that the shuttle took much longer to design than had been expected. There were also many other unexpected delays, and in 1986 came a tragedy when the Challenger orbiter exploded just after liftoff, killing its crew. But by now, many of the early problems have been overcome, and the shuttle's successes far outweigh its failures. If we are to continue to explore space, the versatile shuttle is essential. No other craft can launch multiple satellites and space laboratories and also act as an orbiting service station for recovering and repairing ailing satellites. The final minutes of the countdown to the launch of the Space Shuttle tick away. The shuttle stack, a winged orbiter, external tank and twin solid fuel boosters sits on the mobile launch platform, poised for liftoff. At about T minus six seconds, the main shuttle engines light up with a roar. The whole stack rocks forward, but it's still bolted down. As the stack rocks back, the solid fuel rocket boosters ignite. The bolts holding the shuttle to the launch platform are severed, and we have liftoff. With all engines firing, the shuttle lifts off the launch platform and clears the tower. With acceleration building up, the shuttle is soon high in the sky. After two minutes, it's 50 kilometers high, and the boosters are running out of fuel. They are cut loose and fall away, eventually parachuting back to be recovered and used again. Meanwhile, the shuttle's main engines continue firing, thrusting the orbiter faster and faster and higher and higher. About eight minutes after liftoff, the main engines cut off, as in turn the external tank runs out of fuel. The tank is then jettisoned and falls back into the lower atmosphere where it breaks up. It's the only part of the shuttle stack that's not used again. The orbiter coasts for some time before its two orbital maneuvering engines fire to inject it into the predetermined orbit usually at a height of about 280 kilometers. It's now traveling at orbital velocity, about 28,000 kilometers per hour. At the end of its mission in space, the orbiter positions itself so that it's traveling tail first. The orbital maneuvering system engines fire again, slowing down the orbiter to below orbital velocity. Gravity now takes hold and pulls the orbiter back to Earth. The orbiter repositions itself so that it's once again traveling nose first 
and plunges into the ever-thickening atmosphere. The air drag builds up, severely breaking the orbiter and generating frictional heat, which makes the heat shield piles on the underside glow red hot. During this re-entry period, the crew experience a radio blackout, because radio waves can't penetrate the surrounding searing hot, ionized air. By the time the orbiter emerges from the blackout period, it's flying aerodynamically, manoeuvring by its wings and rudder. It's now become an aircraft. As it descends lower and gets nearer its landing site, it makes a series of turns to cut down the speed further. Then, with the runway at sight, it brings up its nose and glides steeply in to land. The landing gear is lowered and the orbiter touches down at a speed of about 350 kilometers per hour. The air brakes and wheel brakes come on, and the orbiter comes to a halt, earthbound once again. A space station is a large spacecraft in which astronauts can remain for an extended period of time. The first space station was Russia's Salyut 1, launched in 1971. Tragically, its first long-stay cosmonauts perished when returning to Earth. The first, and so far the only, American space station was Skylab, launched in 1973 and visited over 10 months by three successive crews for periods up to 84 days. A tremendous amount of scientific research was carried out and it became clear that human beings could, in fact, remain in space under conditions of zero gravity for reasonably long periods at least, without suffering physical damage. The Russians subsequently launched a series of salutes, culminating in the highly successful Salyut 7, launched in 1982. A new generation Russian craft, Mir, went into orbit in 1986 and has been the home for cosmonauts for many months at a time. If all goes well, NASA's permanently manned space station, Freedom, should be in orbit by the end of this century. Space stations are of tremendous value in many ways. In the future, they will be set up by nations working together and pooling their resources. Space research must become truly international. We've sent spacecraft to the moon and planets, but when we come to consider the stars, we have to realize that the whole situation is different. We are dealing with distances not of millions of miles, but of millions of millions of miles. Even light takes over four years to reach us from the nearest star beyond the sun. Certainly, we can't send rockets to planets of other stars, even assuming, as most people do, that such planets really exist. We can, however, use space research methods to investigate systems in the far reaches of the universe. For example, IRS, the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, which operated for much of 1983, established that many stars are associated with cool material which may indicate planetary systems, and there are other cases of information we can obtain only by space research methods. In 1992, a satellite, the Cosmic Background Explorer, even sent back data which help us to understand what happened when the universe was very young, not long after the Big Bang, when everything was created, at least 15,000 million years ago. Can space research methods ever tell us about life in other systems? This isn't possible at the moment. All we can hope to do with our present technology is to pick up radio signals sufficiently rhythmic to tell us that other beings exist. In the future, of course, we may be able to travel to other stars, but at present, methods such as thought travel and teleportation are just as much science fiction as television was a couple of centuries ago. If we are ever to achieve interstellar travel, we must await a fundamental breakthrough, and of this there is no sign as yet. It may come this year, next year, in a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years, or never. We must wait and see.
The American space program had a slow beginning, but by now it's taken the lead in most ways. Only the United States have been able to send men to the moon, for example, and to launch rockets toward the outer planets. Only the United States has brought spacecraft gently down onto the deserts of Mars, and made a thorough, if so far unsuccessful, search for Martian life. The main problems have centred on the shuttle, which took much longer to develop than had been expected, and which was further delayed by the Challenger tragedy in 1986. It is to be hoped that these problems are now behind us, but there's still the problem of money. It's a little use pointing out to Congress that a spacecraft or a comet costs less than a couple of nuclear submarines. At the moment, plans are being made for further expeditions to the planets, as well as a permanent space station, and further scientific vehicles of all types. If the funds are available, we may hope for spectacular advances in space research during the next few years. Light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Boat control, both auto descent, engine command override off. Engine arm off. 13 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot.
I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Thank you. 